Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, you're probably tired of me <laughs> saying this, but uh, my name is Amy Consalvi, and I am the Director of Education at the museum. And as I was thinking about this introduction, uh, thinking about how this is the last program of 2020 and what a heck of a year it's been, um, I found myself actually not really knowing what to say this time around. Uh, I think it's fitting that today, uh, in the West at least, it's the faint, uh, Feast of St. Nicholas. And in a year when so many of us are facing hardship and uncertainty, we should take this day to be thankful and to give back to those less fortunate than us, um, just as St. Nicholas would have done and come to find out uh, today, you know, just as the Imperial family would have done. I wanna thank you all for supporting the museum during these critical times. And I really truly hope that the new year will bring you all hope, happiness and good health. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker who is no stranger to the museum. Uh, Nicholas B.A. Nicholson is an expert in European fine and decorative arts of the 17th through 20th centuries and is recognized for his specialization in Russian works of art. During his 25 years in the art world, he has worked as as an auction house specialist, as a curator, as an art advisor, and today as director of development for the Russian History Museum in Jordanville, New York. Some of you may remember that Nick was a co-curator for our recent exhibition, Tradition and Opulence, Easter in Imperial Russia. He has recently finished an annotated translation of the diaries of Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich of Russia. Michael Romanov, brother of the last Tsar, Diaries and Letters, 1916 through 1918. He's co-author of Fabergé, The Imperial Empire Eggs of 1902, and Tatiana Romanov, Daughter of the Last Tsar. He is currently at work on a new book, The Other Romanovs, The Vladimirs, Passions and Politics in the Belle Epoque. Nick, I will turn it over to you. Amy, first of all, Amy, thank you so much. That was a beautiful introduction and just the right one for not just the last lecture of 2020, but any lecture. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Lana Slutsky and Kent Russell for asking me to do this a couple of months ago. Um, as some of you may know, you may be familiar with the exhibition Tradition and Opulence, which we uh, launched earlier this year to um, some some difficulties with which many of you are aware. Um, and in it, we explored all of the themes around Russian Orthodox Easter and the ways in which the Romanov family celebrated Easter, which many people are very, very familiar with, but people aren't as familiar with the way the Russian Imperial family celebrated Christmas. Um, and in talking about that, I have to talk about the fact, and it's sort of difficult for some people to hear or believe, but the way we celebrate Christmas today is a completely alien tradition that was created in the mid 19th century, and it was really new to everyone. Um, there are some very early um, examples of Germans having Christmas trees in the centers of their towns, and um, a little bit of the English doing similar things, but it really solidified in the mid 19th century. And so I want to take a little tour of Christmas practices before we talk about ancient Byzantium and old Moscow and the way the Romanovs celebrated uh, Christmas. We all know and understand the Western traditions around Christmas. And for those of us uh, for whom it's part of our tradition, we celebrate it as a time to come together and we exchange gifts. And we do this in remembrance of the gifts that were brought to the manger for the Christ child at his birth. The celebrations that we think of today as Christmas, you know, with decorated trees and the exchange of presents and uh, mulled wine and spiced cookies, these are largely um, a mixture of German and Anglo-Dutch traditions that began in the 19th century. Here in America, um, the Puritans not so much into Christmas. Uh, the Puritans actually felt that Christmas was a sacred day that should be spent entirely in church and free of any other behaviors or celebrations. Uh, William Bradford wrote that it was very difficult for him to stamp out the pagan mockery of the observance of Christmas and he penalized uh, Puritans for any kind of celebration or frivolity that took place outside of their churches. Even in England, Oliver Cromwell preached against Christmas and its heathen traditions. Um, and in 1659, uh, for those of you in Massachusetts today, the General Court of Massachusetts enacted a law making any observance of December 25th outside of a church service completely illegal. It was a penal offense and people were fined even for hanging decorations. And this is an awesome piece from the, Brook, the uh, Boston Public Library. Public notice 
the observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege and the exchanging of gifts and greetings, dressing in fine clothing, feasting, and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. Um, that kind of thought about Christmas and about Christmas uh, traditions really remained in effect in the United States until there was an influx of both German and English uh, settlers. The Germans began to use Christmas trees in the early 19th century, and they were looked somewhat askance by other American visitors, uh, other Americans. But by the middle of the 19th century, uh, it turned out to be Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, who you see here in 1846 in the Illustrated London News, who set up a tabletop Christmas tree on a table uh, at Windsor Castle and were not photographed, but shown in an engraved manner in the news uh, as celebrating Christmas this way. And it took off not just in England, where it became, you know, a world of Dickens and Christmas celebrations that we, we all uh, know today, but um, around the world, America really adopted this Victorian, this really Victorian tradition because it starts with Victoria. Now, in Russia, we had a very, very different situation as all of you know, because you're familiar with the museum, the Russians are part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, which celebrates the nativity not only on a different date, but in a very different way. Um, the feast of the nativity is celebrated throughout the Orthodox world, but the Orthodox tradition has never placed the emphasis on Christmas Eve, uh, on the night itself or the things that we associate with Christmas. In fact, the Feast of the Nativity marks the end of an almost 40 day fast called the St. Philip's Fast or the Nativity Fast, which has always been a period of spiritual preparation for the arrival of Christmas. It's a period of real abstinence um, when the Russians abstain from meat and poultry and dairy and fish and wine and all kinds of uh, things that we eat on a regular basis. Basis. This uh, is a tradition that was inherited from Byzantium, and in ancient Byzantium, um, the 12 days of Christmas are really more important, the 12 days between Christmas and what the Russians call Theophany, which we call Epiphany in the West. Um, in ancient Byzantium, which is where so much of Russian Orthodox, so much Russian court tradition comes, the 12 days of Christmas are the ones that are really associated uh, with Christmas. There are lavish feasts every day. There were receptions for members of the imperial family, uh, the aristocrats, the army, diplomatic visitors, etc. And this is the tradition that took hold in Russia with these 12 days of feasting to celebrate relief from the fast period. There's quite an extraordinary book called the Damastroi, which is a book of rules for Russian households in the age of Ivan the Terrible. And it says that the days of feasts and the welcoming of guests was absolutely mandatory behavior by every Russian. And the book includes this extraordinary catalog of the dishes that were considered mandatory to be served in Moscow. The uh, illustration on the screen shows a 17th century banquet at the Kremlin. And you can only imagine that this was the kind of food they would have received during the 12 days of Christmas. During the great Christmas feast, you must put on the food these tables. Swans, swan giblets, roast goose, black grouse, partridge, hazel grouse, roast suckling pig, salt, mutton, baked mutton, pickled sucking pig, suckling pig innards, chicken soup, corned beef seasoned with garlic and herbs, elk, pickled elk heart, chopped elk heart, elk lips, elk liver, elk brains, pan fried hare, pickled hare, roasted chicken, goose giblets, pot roasted beef, pot roasted pork, pot roasted ham, ham, sausages, stuffed stomach, pot roasted goose, pot roasted chicken, crooked turbot, pea noodles, noodles, carp, dumpling, and cabbage soup. I will spare you the similarly um, elaborate lists of dairy products and fish products, which were also mandatory, but you can see that the 12 days of feasting uh, inherited from Byzantium was the way the Russian court celebrated for a long time. It wasn't until the arrival of Peter the Great, as with so many other things, that the scene changed forever. With his western facing capital of St. Petersburg, we begin to see a shift in the way the winter holidays were celebrated in Russia. Peter hated the empty and expensive practices of banqueting for 12 days, which he had grown up with. And as part of his westernizations on the December 20th, 1699, Peter the Great issued the order on celebrating the new year. And the order introduced the Julian calendar to Russia. 
before that chronology was counted from the creation of the world. And so Peter's order mandated keeping calendar since the birth of Christ. As a result, the Russian year of 7,208 became 1699. His other big novelty was to start the new year on January 1st, because for Russians, the ecclesiastical calendar began in September. Um, but with this January 1st celebration, which he made mandatory, he aligned himself with Western Europe. And uh, in addition to the new calendar, Peter ordered new customs and traditions. He ordered that houses should be decorated with fir trees and pine and juniper branches, and that people should congratulate each other both on the new year and the new century when they ran into each other in the streets. He also started fireworks in Red Square. These traditions uh, cemented themselves. And so for a long time, Russian New Year was considered the primary holiday rather than Russian Christmas. It was the end of the long winter season. Under the following three empresses, uh, among other rulers of Russia who reigned rather briefly, the empresses Catherine I on the left, Anna Ioannovna in the center, and Elizabeth I on the right, uh, these traditions were really strengthened and developed, and New Year's Day was really the center of those festivities, a fact that remains true in Russia even today. It wasn't until the arrival of the very young Princess Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst, who you will know as Catherine, later Catherine the Great, um, that the first people began to exchange Christmas gifts at the court. Catherine the Great you know, was born in the West and she began to exchange gifts on Christmas Eve with her closest friends and family, just in the same way she had done in the West before coming to Russia. Her son, Grand Duke Paul Petrovich, and his wife, Grand Duchess Maria Fyodorovna, also quietly observed German traditions of gift giving at home and exchanging presents. This is a wonderful painting of Paul I and his entire family. Um, Paul was known to favor German traditions. His father was a Duke of Holstein Gottorp and uh, Peter III, and so they had uh, adopted German traditions at home. And his wife had been born a Duchess of. Sorry, that happens. Uh, had been born a Duchess of Württemberg in Germany as well. And so they had a large family. So their children were clearly not unaware of the Western traditions surrounding Christmas, but they were regarded as foreign traditions and not traditions that would be publicly acceptable in Russia. So the exchanging of presents remained a very private affair in the family. Um, it wasn't until after the death of Catherine and Paul during the reign of their son, Alexander I, who you can see casually leaning at left on a bust of his ancestor, Peter the Great, um, that real Christmas arrived in Russia in the form of a young Grand Duchess. And she brought with her the Christmas that we all know. This is a painting of King Wilhelm of Prussia and his family. And at the very far left, not sitting down, but leaning against the Empress is, uh, leaning against the Queen, is the young Princess Frederica Luisa Charlotte Wilhelmina of Prussia at the Charlottenburg Palace. And she was born um, on 13th of July, 1798, and was the eldest surviving daughter of Frederick Wilhelm III, King of Prussia, and Duchess Louise of mecklenburg strelitz she was a sister of Frederick Wilhelm IV and Wilhelm I, German emperor. She was called Charlotte, a name popular in the Prussian royal family and nicknamed Lottchen by her family. Her mother died when she was quite young, when she was only about 12. And as the oldest girl, very shortly after, she became the most senior lady of the Prussian court at 12 and began to take over the role that her mother had occupied at receptions and at important uh, Prussian events. One of those events happened in February of 1814 when Grand Duke Nicholas Pavlovich, the future Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, and his brother Grand Duke Mikhail Pavlovich visited Berlin. Arrangements were made at that meeting for the two dynasties to form an alliance and for Nicholas to marry Charlotte, then 15 years old, to strengthen the union between Russia and Prussia. Nicholas was only second in line to the throne as the heir was his brother, Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich, but he had no children. On a second visit the following year, Nicholas fell completely in love with the then 17-year-old Princess Charlotte, and the feeling was mutual. She wrote in her diary, I like him, and I'm sure that I will be happy with him. She wrote to her brother, what we have in common is an inner life. Let the world do as it pleases. In our hearts, we have a world of our own. They wandered around the Potsdam countryside together, enjoyed the opera at Berlin, and by the end of his visit in October 1816, Nicholas and Charlotte were engaged. 
On the 9th of June, 1817, Charlotte came to Russia with her brother William, and after arriving in St. Petersburg, she converted to Russian Orthodoxy and took the name Alexandra Fyodorovna. The name Alexandra was chosen as an homage to the Emperor Alexander, and the patronymic Fyodorovna was chosen to show that she was now under the protection of the Fyodorovskaya icon of the Mother of God, which served as protectress, protectress to the House of Romanov. The first Christmas of their marriage in 1817, Nicholas and Alexandra Fyodorovna were in Moscow, and it is there that we have the first recorded Romanov Christmas tree in Russia. Set up in the green drawing room at the Nicholas Palace in the Kremlin complex in Moscow, which you can see a watercolor of here. The palace was then under reconst extensive reconstruction after having been burned in the, during the Napoleonic invasions of 1812. Um, we don't know if Alexandra Fyodorovna asked to have a Christmas tree set up or if Nicholas knew that it was a tradition that was common in Prussia and he did it to make her less homesick. But we do know that from that time and the arrival of this Prussian princess, the Romanovs were never without a tree at Christmas again. As Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna, um, the former Princess Charlotte really solidified Christmas traditions as they would be celebrated in the Russian court. Immediately after the Christmas service uh, in the concert hall or the rotunda of the Winter Palace, there would be an enormous Christmas party for the members of the Romanov family, which was becoming quite large and all of their attendants. Each member of the family would have their own decorated Christmas tree and near the tree would stand a table covered with a white tablecloth on which all of the gifts, gifts for the family member would be placed. This is a wonderful view from the mid 19th century of the Rotunda Hall at the Hermitage where the Christmas trees were set up for the family members. We were always collected in the chamber of Her Majesty, wrote Baroness Marie Fredericks, a maid of honor of the Imperial Court. And there behind the closed doors, we would all wait. All the children, including the czars, were fighting and pushing to get to each other first to get into the coveted hall. The Empress went ahead of all of us to inspect the tables one more time and our hearts beat in joy and anticipation. Suddenly the Emperor rang a bell, the doors opened and everyone ran with noise and clamor into the hall lit by thousands of candles. The Empress herself took each person to their designated table and handed out gifts personally. This is a wonderful image that I used for this exhibition, showing in fact the public parties that began to be held in the rotunda of the Winter Palace with Christmas trees. The Romanovs began to uh, hold bazaars to raise money for charity and to invite other members of the community in St. Petersburg uh, to celebrate Christmas with them. And it was at these parties, much in the same way the um, uh, engraving of Queen Victoria began to spread the popularity of Christmas trees. These these engravings of the imperial family celebrating Christmas began to popularize the tradition around Russia. Celebrations under Alexander II, the, their son, uh, continued to be held and it was only really the venue for these places that changed. Under Alexander II, uh, Christmas trees were more often set up in the golden room of the Winter Palace, which remains today as part of the Hermitage Museum. You can see it here in a wonderful watercolor from the mid 19th century. And in 1866, the Imperial family began to hold Christmas events for 100 poor children every year at the Anishkov Palace. Each was given a coat, shoes, warm clothes, underwear, or a dress. And after the meal, Tsarevich Alexander, the future Alexander, and the third would order the Christmas tree to be knocked down so that the children could climb over them and choose one of the toys that had been hung from it as a souvenir. From then onward, palace Christmas parties for poor children became an annual event and the public representational duties of the imperial family during the holidays grew. Because of the many military regiments that the family were honorary patrons of, as well as the hospitals where they were patrons and the libraries and the universities. Um, these Christmas parties called yolka or tree lightings uh, began to be a common part of the imperial schedule during the holidays. Under Alexander III, who was the son of Alexander II, uh, Alexander really preferred time spent at Gachina Palace, which was outside of St. Petersburg, and where the Christmas trees were early on placed in the yellow or crimson drawing rooms. 
The trees were placed later all over Gachina Palace, including in the Arsenal Stair Hall. You can see here at the left a wonderful watercolor illustration of the Crimson Room as it existed at Gachina Palace in 1850. And you can see the same room today on the right after restoration. Gachina was almost completely destroyed during the Second World War. And like many of the palaces outside of Russia, uh, it has been completely rebuilt. And it's fortunate that it still has uh, many of the original furnishings. You you can see several of the chairs survive. The same table is in both pictures, and many of the uh, wonderful Don Quixote tapestries have survived as well. So this is the room in which most of the Romanos in the period of Alexander III would remember seeing their family trees. However, what is interesting is Grand Duchess Olga Alexandrovna, the daughter of Alexander III, provides us with a wonderful watercolor illustration that she did in her childhood showing the Romanov men getting the tree ready. You can see that uh, Nicholas II is standing on the, um, I don't really know what to call them except to call them bleachers, uh, a sort of elevated display platform where Christmas gifts were being settled. I believe that the man facing us with the mustache is Olga's brother, Grand Duke Michael, and that the other men in Cossack uniforms are members of the Romanov family. Um, though the palace records don't show that Christmas was celebrated in the Arsenal stair hall, we can see from this watercolor that in fact it was, and this is where the tree was set up. Right here is a view of the Arsenal stair hall today, and you can see the same yellow columns that are depicted in the picture that we just looked at painted by Grand Duchess Olga. I believe if you look towards the back of the photograph where those chandeliers are hanging and where the windows are and where the two dark columns are, that's where the tree was, um, was placed in the middle of that sort of barrel vaulted area at the end of the stairs. And when working on, um, the translation of the diaries of Grand Duke Michael, my colleague Helen Azar found this photograph in Michael's records. You can see the same lamps that we saw in the previous illustrations and we can see the Christmas tree set up at the end of the uh, staircase. So this is an actual photograph of the Romanov Christmas tree celebrated in I think 1916, because that's when Michael was back in Russia. Um, also, I'm sort of pleased to note in the lower right hand corner, you can see that table covered with a white cloth that everybody mentioned. So Clearly, it was a, a tradition to put all of the presents uh, on the table. Grand Duchess Olga um, said of herself that we always dined in the room next to the banquet hall. The doors of the hall were closed, Cossack guards stood on duty in front of them, and we all waited for only one thing, for the useless dessert to be carried away and for our parents to stand up from the table to go to the banquet hall. But the children and all the rest had to wait until the emperor rang the bell. Then forgetting all etiquette and decorum, we would rush the doors of the banquet hall, the doors would swing open wide, and we found ourselves in a magical kingdom of Christmas. The gift that I always gave to Papa was the product of my own hands. I gave him one year soft red shoes embroidered with white crosses, and I was so pleased to see him wearing them later. Um, the gifts that the Romanos gave to one another ran the gamut. They could be very, very expensive gifts. It was noted that uh, the Empress Maria Fyodorovna gave Alexander III a very expensive Smith & Wesson handgun uh, one year. Um, but the family also made presents for one another, knowing that the only thing that really mattered to them because they had everything on earth were gifts that they made themselves. During the last reign um, of the last Tsar, Nicholas and Alexandra, the family began to withdraw from public events. As many of you who know anything about the Romanov family know, both Nicholas and Alexandra really shied away from public spectacle. They didn't enjoy the life in St. Petersburg. They didn't like the massive receptions at the Winter Palace. And so they spent most of their time at the Alexander Palace at Savsky Silo outside of St. Petersburg, where they had quiet family celebrations. Christmas was very important to the Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna because though she had been born in Hesse, her mother, Princess Alice, was a daughter of Queen Victoria. So she grew up with all of the English and German Christmas traditions that we've been discussing. And she passed those on to her children. Um, after 1904, they celebrated Christmas exclusively at the Alexander Palace. And you can see here two really wonderful photographs showing the um, Christmas decorations of the um, Imperial family in the Alexander Palace. You can see on the right, one of the decorated trees with the four grand duchesses 
Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and Olga sitting beneath the tree. And then on the left, a wonderful image of the uh, Christmas tree sitting on the table. They had a, a tree size, a table tree, uh, which a lot of people also have today. One of the ladies in waiting of the Empress, Alexandra Fyodorovna, said that the, one of the peculiarities of Alexandra Fyodorovna was that her greatest joy, the thing that she liked most of all, was blowing out all of the candles on the tree at the end of the night to make sure that none of them were still lighted. And that she was extremely proud of the fact that using a very powerful puff of breath, she could blow out the candles at the top all by herself without a ladder and without any help. And she did that every year, apparently. Um, the Imperial family continued to celebrate Christmas in this way until the beginning of the First World War. And the First World War began to change things for them, largely because all of the girls were getting to be adult age. They ranged in age from about 17 to 20. And the girls began to uh, perform the kinds of duties that their parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents had always performed at Christmas. Here, you can see a photograph dating from around 1916 during the war showing Grand Duchess Maria and Grand Duchess Anastasia who are standing to the left visiting their lazariette or the hospital of which they were patron and meeting with members of the hospital staff there with a Christmas tree in the background. The Grand Duchesses visited soldiers in hospitals. They went to Christmas parties for the regiments who were going off to fight in the First World War and distributed gifts. They hosted parties for their friends and for soldiers and for people involved in the war effort, including the committees which raised so much money for the war effort during the First World War. Um, and as a result, they were, they were seen quite a lot the, um, oh, I appear to be missing a page. That's rather upsetting. In the last years uh, before the revolution, in particularly in 1916, Christmas was actually ruined uh, for the imperial family because Grigory Rasputin was murdered in early December by members of the imperial family. And so the family gathered and tried to celebrate Christmas with a certain degree of festivities, but the empress was broken by the betrayal of her family. And um, all of the girls gathered and tried to cheer her up. Though Christmas was at the Alexander Palace, there is a letter that survives from uh, Tatiana, who's standing on the right to her mother saying, at Christmas, dear priceless mama, I pray that God will help you now through this awful difficult time. May he bless and protect you from all evil. I am certain that the soul of our beloved friend is always with us and that he prays for you, my sweet angel mama, with affectionate kisses from your loving daughter, Tatiana. Even Grand Duchess Olga wrote in her diary, Mama doesn't feel too well, but she is so brave throughout all of this. Save her, Lord. Christmas, of course, led into the Russian revolutions of February and March and the abdication of Nicholas II, um, the deferral of the throne by their uncle Michael and the resulting formation of the provisional government in March of 1917. The provisional government placed the entire imperial family under house arrest at the Alexander Palace, and they stayed there until May 1917, where they were transferred to Tobolsk in Siberia, ostensibly for their own safety. But even in Siberia, the family managed to pull together what would be their last Christmas together and exchanged handmade gifts of paintings and embroidery. This is um, a photograph of the governor's residence in Tobolsk, which was where the imperial family was imprisoned. You can see the high stockade fence around the house to the left. But in the front, in this blurry image, you can see uh, Cesarevich Alexei being pulled in a sled by another member of the family in the snow. So they were allowed out periodically. Um, Grand Duchess Tatiana wrote a letter to her friend, Countess Zinaida Tolstaya, on 26 December 1917 from the governor's residence in Tobolsk from captivity. We had a Christmas party such as it was for all those who live in the house with us. During the evening of the 24th at 9.30, we had a vigil rather late, but the priest could not get here any earlier. And at the table where we set up all the icons, we also set up a tree all lit up with candles. It stood there during the entire vigil. It was very nice and very cozy. We did not and could not hang anything from the tree. Unfortunately, um, the Imperial family didn't make it to 1918. As everybody knows, they were murdered in Ekaterinburg in the summer of 1918. And um, 
almost immediately after the revolution, the Bolsheviks outlawed all Christmas celebrations. Uh, initially, the Soviets tried to, tried to replace Christmas with a more appropriate uh, young communist day, the Komsomol, but uh, shockingly, this did not take. People weren't really excited about it. And by 1928, the Soviets had banned Christmas and Christmas celebrations entirely, and December 25th was a regular working day, even if it was during the work week. Um, the slide that you see here from Gizbozhnik magazine, which is a uh, an atheist magazine published in the Soviet Union, this is a 1931 <laughs> edition published by the League of Militant Atheists showing a caricature of a Russian Orthodox priest being forbidden to take home a tree to celebrate Christmas and New Year's because it was banned under Marxist-Leninist doctrine of state atheism. Then around 1935, uh, Joseph Stalin decided that between the uh, the Great Famine and the Great Terror to return a celebratory tree to Soviet children. He decided that Christmas trees weren't going to be Christmas trees, they would be trees to celebrate the new year, not religious Christmas celebrations, but Peter the Great's new year and the secular new year, which future oriented as it was, uh, lined extremely well with Soviet ideology. So since the 1930s, Christmas, these trees were permitted around New Year's celebrations, which as I mentioned earlier, are still today the most important celebrations of the holidays. Christmas itself was decriminalized almost 30 years ago in 1991, and it's indeed celebrated by religious and non-religious Russians with trees and with gifts, uh, either at Christmas or at the New Year. But the big celebrations are still reserved in Russia for New Year's Eve. This is another uh, wonderful watercolor painted by Grand Duchess Olga Alexandrovna, but it was painted in 1935 when she was in exile in Denmark with her family long after the revolution. And you can see here the wonderful decorated tree with candles and the famous white table with a white cloth and a silver samovar and Danish porcelain showing that even in exile, it's clear that the Romanos kept to the Christmas traditions that they themselves introduced to Russia a hundred years before. And that is the crux of my lecture for today. And if you have any questions, I would be really happy to answer them. It feels like it went incredibly quickly to me. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a marathon through the holiday, uh, you know, through the lens of the imperial family, but, um, you know, definitely learned a few things. Um, and we'll open it up to audience questions. Uh, please use the, the Q&A feature uh, down below. Uh, it's on that bottom uh, bar in your Zoom window. So we'll just give folks when I when I ran this by myself, speaking slowly, it was forty five minutes. <laughs> so somehow I lost it. It's the it's the way of Zoom programs. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is, or it's the Christmas spirit that rushed me through it. So I'm yes. very happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone has. So our first question: um, Are there any specific traditions on Christmas Day itself? Well, it really depends um, because the traditions in Russia today run the gamut. There are still families that celebrate with gifts on Christmas Eve, really rather than on Christmas morning. But as I mentioned, the majority of the people uh, celebrate New Year's Day with exchange of gifts. That's really still, you can look at it at Peter the Great's holiday or you can look at it as the, the modern Soviet holiday, but that's really the big day in Russia today. Um, I know that many of my uh, Russian emigre friends who are here in the West and have been now for over a hundred years uh, still celebrate with uh, Christmas presents on Christmas Eve. Great. This is, morning, uh, this is sort of an American thing, yeah. Right, right, definitely. Uh, so other than embroidered slippers, what kind of gifts did the Romanovs give each other? Are there any pictures or drawings out there that people could reference? Sure. Actually, if you go to the website of the, um, you know, even better, if you hold on and wait until 2021, when the exhibition Last Days of the Last Tsar opens at the Museum of Russian Icons, uh, you can actually see some of the gifts that were made and exchanged in that last Christmas. They included hand-painted bookmarks, they included embroidered book covers and pillowcase covers. Um, there were beautiful Christmas cards and letters that were hand-painted that were exchanged between members of the imperial family. And before the 
the revolution, there were, of course, very expensive gifts that were routinely um, exchanged. Uh, the empress uh, dowager Maria Fyodorovna always gave her son a cigarette case and a pair of cufflinks from Fabergé. And you can see the illustrations of many of those cufflinks in books today. They're often sold again at auction. The emperor and empress Alex, uh, Nicholas and Alexandra also exchanged Christmas gifts every year and sent Christmas gifts to their relatives abroad, many of them from Fabergé, Ovchinikov, Grachev, and other famous silver and silver makers and jewelers of the period. So there were gifts on all levels, at all levels, um, exchanged between the imperial family and their friends and relatives. It was not on the same scale, uh, perhaps, as Easter, when there were massive gifts given um, officially. It was really a private holiday and a family holiday. And if you go online and type in Fabergé frame Imperial Family Christmas on Google, I bet you're going to find a bunch of wonderful Fabergé frames with signed photographs that were often sent as gifts. Great. We have a couple questions uh, about the uh, decorations on the trees and what those would look like. What, would the, what were the ornaments typically of? Um, or was it handmade ornaments? If you could talk just a little bit about that. Well, the primary thing that we can see both from the watercolor illustrations that we saw and also from the photographs, the primary thing was there were candles mounted on all of the branches, actual candles that were on fire. Um, that was a German tradition. And there was a massive uh, German Christmas tree uh, ornament um, industry. And so I presume given the illustrations in the watercolors, you can see that there are lots of mirrored glass balls and tinsel, and that's exactly the kind of thing that the German factories were producing. I am unaware of Russian factories that produced the same kind of material. We also know from the passage that I read to you about Alexander III loving to pull the tree down with his bare hands so that the children could strip it of the toys that had been hung on it, we can, sort of presume that in some cases they actually hung gifts on the trees of dolls or toys or stuffed animals, one presumes. Um, wooden toys were very popular in the period. So there may have been things like our nutcrackers that were hung on the trees and loops. We also know um, that trees were sometimes festooned with uh, oranges tied with ribbons. Oranges were an enormous luxury in Russia and only began to be available at the very end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century when the resorts opened at Gaspra in the Crimea. Um, as a result of that and the first Crimean oranges arriving in the capital around Christmas at the end of the 19th century, it's a must have to have oranges uh, in your house on Christmas for Russians as gifts, etc. Right. Um, so, of course, this lecture was in the context of the imperial family, um, but could you touch a little bit on um, the working or the middle classes, what their Christmas celebrations would have looked like in Russia at this time? It is phenomenally difficult to make generalizations like that when speaking about Russians and Russian practice. We tend to forget that Russia was um, an enormously multi-ethnic um, empire and that there were a great many different religious traditions encompassed within the empire. And even within the cities, um, what might have gone over for a merchant class family would be very different than what was happening at an aristocratic family. So I think you could say that members of the highest aristocracy were probably observing practices that were the most similar to the imperial family. They had enormous exposure to uh, Germany and German traditions. They intermarried with German and French families who celebrated Christmas in this way. And so Western traditions were likely very visible in those homes. As you move laterally or down the social scale, you would find Russians who were very orthodox and very religious who wouldn't have anything to do with any of these practices and would restrict themselves to observing the, the fast and the feast on Christmas. Um, and then probably would have celebrated New Year's Day in a sort of less uh, over the top kind of way. Um, for the poor, there was of course very rare time to celebrate at all. Um, and as you know from what we covered in the lecture, the imperial family uh, began to organize uh, yolk, you know, these Christmas tree events uh, at orphanages, at hospitals. Uh, they invited children to the imperial palaces to receive gifts. And so they sort of disseminated their practice uh, in this way. But again, this was 
really enjoyed for a very short period of time. If the first Christmas tree goes up in the Kremlin in 1817 and the last one is at Tobolsk in 1917, that's barely a hundred years. And that's almost not long enough for a tradition like this to take root as it has here in the United States where now we can't even imagine Christmas without it. So true. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Um, so speaking of Orthodox, uh, you know, really how are icons used in all of this in the Christmas celebrations? Um, of course, I think a lot of us from, are familiar with the large Easter celebrations, celebrations in the Orthodox church, um, but what will Christmas have looked like in the churches? Well, again, um, one of the things that we remember about Orthodox practice is that the icons change as the calendar changes. So when you enter a Russian Orthodox church on the evening of uh, Christmas, where there is a what they call an all night vigil, um, you will encounter uh, an icon of the nativity, such as the one that I showed earlier today, which was a very typical one, and in fact, a new addition to the collection at the Museum of Russian Icons. And the church would likely be decorated with evergreens. This was probably not an ancient Orthodox practice and probably came in around the time of Peter the Great insisting that the churches and houses of Moscow and Petersburg need to be decorated with evergreen branches to celebrate the new year. But this kind of um, adaptation is something that you would have seen in the decoration of the churches. Um, there's a very specific uh, type of music uh, for Christmas, the Russians have an enormous tradition of nativity choral music, which would have been heard by people. It's not, it's not like our tradition of Christmas carols where everybody knows the songs and sings along, um, but it's a, it's a definite liturgical um, expression that is very familiar to all Russians. Uh, in homes, everybody had icon corners um, and mostly I believe people would have paid special attention to the icons of the Theodokos, the mother of God, and also to the savior. The large icons of the nativity weren't really for um, home domestic use. They're, it's one of the great 12 feasts. So those kinds of icons would be seen predominantly in churches. And if you visit the museum, <laughs> you can see a lot of those beautiful nativity icons on view and really get a sense of the scale of these icons. And you'll see examples of what would have been typically in someone's home versus the church and really just um, the quality and the uh, detail that really differs between the two, certainly. Um, uh, this is an interesting question, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about how uh, emigre Russians continue the Christmas celebration today, um, particularly January 7th, you know, New Year celebrations, that type of thing. Um, I actually have to say that in my experience, um, one of the one of the chief characteristics of the Russian immigration is their desire to celebrate when possible. Um, I have not encountered a group that is uh, more organized around greeting one another and honoring one another and supporting one another and spending time together uh, during the holidays. So you will see Christmas Eve celebrations, you will see Christmas Day celebrations on both the old calendar and the new calendar. There will be a party for New Year's, <laughs> you know, whether you like it or not. Um, there, is, there is a lot of celebration and it varies from family to family and household to household. And literally it brings back in a certain way, the very thing that Peter the Great tried to stamp out, which is a consecutive series of expensive parties that last from Christmas through New Year's. Those 12 days are happening, whether you like it or not. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I will say though, it's not Easter. Easter is, is, the, big, is the big one, but um, the Christmas traditions are, are broad and widely celebrated to the best of everybody's ability at all times. It's very nice. Yes, it's just a, a good time all around. <laughs> but yes, if you have the opportunity to visit Tradition and Opulence uh, when we reopened, you can see that really the emphasis is placed on, on Easter and the miracles around that holiday. Um, we just have a few more questions, um, but we might end with this one. Uh, are there any Russian folk figures that are part of the Christmas or New Year's traditions that predate the Romanos German and English traditions in Russia? Well, that is really a question for a folklorist and not for me. Um, in the 20th century, in the Soviet iteration of the celebration of Christmas and New Year's, the 
characters of Died Moros, uh, Father Frost, and Snigurichka, the snow maiden, um, have come alive as sort of the uh, Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus of the East. Um, I actually cannot tell you, I do not know if anyone really talked about uh, Died Moros as being part of Christmas in the imperial period or earlier. He's part of the ancient Skazki, but he's more of a, a legendary uh, figure and sort of, um, it's, it, he's, his characterization earlier appears to me to be quite different. I probably should have looked that up for today to tell you the truth. Um, but the, the use of Didmuros and uh, Sniguruchka is really, really there. Well, that will be our holiday lecture for next year. <laughs> <laughs> for next year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then, so finally, um, I think this is a, a great question to end on. Um, can you say the Christmas greeting for us in Russian? Sure. Um, the uh, is Novum Godom is Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. So to all of you. Wonderful. Because we're waiting. It is <laughs> January. It's a little early. We're still in the fast period. But yes. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, like I said, the webinar will be up on our website in about one to two weeks. Uh, please visit us. We are open right now, although we will be closed between Christmas and New Year's this year, just to give everybody a much needed break. Um, be safe and best wishes, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.